from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. here to have a book talk about In Our Books and Beyond series, which is a series of uh, new books that have been published that have some connection with the Library of Congress or also point out the importance of good resources uh, and celebrate the outcome of good library resources, which is often a book, and it's a book that we are able, we hope to uh, not only plug and promote, but to encourage people to read and to learn more about the particular field uh, by consulting their local libraries as well as the Library of Congress. Uh, today's talk, as, is, as are all of our Books and Beyond talks, is being filmed uh, for the <coughs> Library of Congress website. And there will be a presentation by our author and also a, a, a question and answer period and uh, we hope that uh, you participate in that, but I have to tell you that there's a chance you might be part of our website project if you do participate, so thank you for your permission in advance. <laughs> uh, but that also means we'd like you to turn off all things electronic, and I will be pleased to uh, introduce now our speaker and this wonderful book, which I told uh, Dan I would be happy to be the shill and point out there was an advertisement uh, in this current issue of the New York Times uh, book review uh, about this book, and he has lots and lots of uh, really rave reviews, and I congratulate him and uh, am pleased that you, we will all be able to enjoy his presentation. Uh, Daniel Strashauer is a two-time Edgar, Edgar Award winning author, and in this book, as you know, he uncovers the riveting true story of the Baltimore plot and we will learn more about that as we uh, proceed to hear the story behind his book and to uh, learn more about what made him create this book for our, not only our enjoyment, but the enjoyment of everybody. Uh, Dan, as I said, is not only an acclaimed narrative historian and biographer and an award winner, but his work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Smithsonian Magazine, as well as other publications. This also is the period when the Library of Congress has its Lincoln uh, exhibit up now, and I urge you, maybe as you flock out of this room, to go across to the Jefferson Building and take a look at our Lincoln exhibit. Uh, there will be a book signing at the end. Uh, we will try to end around 1 o'clock, so there is time for a book signing, and that will be the time, perhaps, for other questions that uh, you don't get to squeeze into the question and answer period. That being said, it's my pleasure to introduce our Books and Beyond speaker for today, Daniel Strashauer, our award-winning biographer, now a one of our Lincoln narratives, narrators. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is a, a particular pleasure to be here at the Library of Congress. I spent a lot of time here while I was working on this book. There was a time when I uh, considered setting up a cot in the newspaper and periodicals uh, room. I made use of the uh, Abraham Lincoln papers, the Civil War collections, and especially the records of the Pinkerton National Detective Agency. But most of all, uh, I relied on many, many helpful reference librarians who were generous with their time and knowledge and went out of their way uh, to help me and point out resources that I would not otherwise have found. Thank you. Uh, before I start, though, uh, <clears throat> I would like to apologize if I seem a little bleary uh, this morning. Uh, I started the day at 3.30 in Chicago. Uh, as some of you will know, uh, a, th a thread that runs through this story is a 13-day train ride 
that Abraham Lincoln took from Illinois to Washington, D.C., and I feel as if I stand before you here <laughs> now with a fresh perspective <laughs> on this having begun the day at 3.30 a.m. Lincoln, too, had to get up at 3.30 a.m. on at least one occasion during his trip from Illinois, owing to the complex arrangements made by his superintendent of arrangements, a man by the name of William S. Wood. And here's how that experience was described by John Hay, Lincoln's personal secretary, who was with him on that journey. He had this to say. We were compelled to rise at 4 a.m. At that hour, the waking human heart yearneth to behold its enemy. <laughs> at that hour, suddenly aroused, Men habitually mild wax vitriolic of temper and demand explanations. Need I intimate that of that weird cluster of men cloaked and muffled in the dim corridors, not one but thirsted for the blood of William S. Wood as the heart thirsteth for the running of brooks? I need not. The anathemas which were intoned from the double-shotted columbiad of objurgation fired off by the stout gentleman who had an opinion, to the piping maledictory treble of the thin man who had lost his spectacles. Let them lie in the lap of that silence whereto they have wandered and fallen asleep. I do not intend to become their historian. Don't you wish <laughs> <laughs> journalists still wrote like that? Okay, first, the story in a nutshell. The year is 1861. Abraham Lincoln has been elected president. Now, stay with me here. It turns out that there was a period in our nation's history when presidential elections had a polarizing effect <laughs> on the population, very unlike the perfect harmony and civility of our present day. So. Over a period of 13 days, as Lincoln <laughs> traveled by train from Springfield to Washington for his inauguration, the air is filled with rumors of an assassination plot. In Maryland, where Lincoln's train will cross below the Mason-Dixon line for the first time, there are rumors that he will be shot or he will be stabbed or that his train will be blown up at a whistle stop in Baltimore. America's top lawman, Alan Pinkerton, of the legendary Pinkerton Detective Agency, is on the scene. He's racing the clock. Lincoln's train is on the way. So Pinkerton has only 13 days to uncover hard evidence of this looming plot before time runs out. And here's how Pinkerton himself described the danger. And I find I need reading glasses. It had been fully determined that the assassination should take place at the Calvert Street Depot, Pinkerton wrote. When the train entered the depot and Mr. Lincoln attempted to pass through the narrow passage leading to the streets, a party already delegated were to engage in a conflict on the outside. And then the policemen were to rush away to quell the disturbance. At that moment, the police being entirely withdrawn, Mr. Lincoln would find himself surrounded by a dense, excited, and hostile crowd. All hustling and jamming against him and then the fatal blow was to be struck. As the detective went on to explain to William Herndon, Lincoln's law partner turned biographer, the plot had been audaciously simple and efficient. Excuse me for endeavoring to impress the plan upon you, he wrote. It was a capital one and much better conceived than the one which finally succeeded four years after in destroying 
Mr. Lincoln's life. Some of you will be familiar with the Baltimore plot as it came to be known, but very few will know the story behind the story, and that story begins with Alan Pinkerton. Pinkerton is a tough nut. He's scrappy, grizzled, quick to anger. He was born in Scotland. He got into trouble with the law in Scotland, and he came to America as a cooper a barrel maker, and it looks like he's going to go on quietly making barrels for the rest of his life. One day, he's out cutting wood for barrel staves, and he stumbles across something suspicious. The next day, he brings the local sheriff back, and together they lead a raid that winds up rounding up a gang of counterfeiters. They were making counterfeit coin on this island on the banks of the river. Next thing you know, Pinkerton is a lawman. And soon after that, he becomes something entirely new, a private detective. His logo is a stern, unblinking eye, <laughs> glaring out over the words, we never sleep. Soon, that logo, the all-seeing eye, brings a new phrase to the language, private eye. We think of the Pinkertons as hard men with big fists and blazing guns. You'll remember Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Paul Newman says, can you do that? I can't do that. Who are those guys? They're Pinkertons. The guys shooting back at the train robbers from inside the freight car. They're Pinkertons. The guys knocking heads together during the strike at the steel mill. Those were Pinkertons too, sad to say. And this last thing, the union busting, has led to a lot of controversy and some misunderstanding over who Alan Pinkerton was and what he did. I had a guy come up to me once and he, he pokes his finger into my chest and he says, Alan Pinkerton, cracked my grandfather over the head with a club at Homestead, put him in the hospital. Are you going to write about that in your book, Mr. Author? Well, two things. One, I quite like being called Mr. Author. <laughs> <laughs> Just n note that. Two. What he was talking about was the Homestead Strike of 1892. This is a truly horrific clash between Pinkerton men and striking steel workers in Pennsylvania. A terrible, bloody episode with plenty of blame to go around and casualties on both sides. But I can tell you for sure that Alan Pinkerton did not crack this gentleman's head this gentleman's grandfather over the head with a club that day. How can I be so sure? Well, because he was dead. <laughs> He'd been dead for eight years. And it's my contention that dead men crack no skulls. <laughs> my point is that Pinkerton's story has gotten tangled up over the years with the darker aspects of his agency's legacy. Alan Pinkerton, the founder of the agency, spent his youth marching for the rights of working men in his native Scotland and came under fire, literally, for doing so. Alan Pinkerton, the founder of the agency, ran a station on the Underground Railroad, helping fugitive slaves on their way north to freedom. He was a close friend of John Brown, the fire and brimstone abolitionist even though the assistance he gave to Brown in the days leading up to Harper's Ferry put him on the wrong side of the law. Now, I'm not here to put him up for sainthood, and I'm not looking to apologize for some of the terrible things that he did and that happened on his watch and especially later on. But there's a story here that never gets told, and it's the story of a barefoot Cooper who becomes a world-famous detective 
and makes his bones protecting America's railroads. And one of his biggest clients is the Illinois Central Railroad. And the Illinois Central also has a lawyer on retainer, and his name is Abraham Lincoln. And thereby hangs a tale. The bottom line is that Pinkerton and Lincoln came to know of each other on the way up. And 10 years on, when Lincoln is being told that there are men waiting to kill him in Baltimore, he trusts Pinkerton. Some of his advisors want him to respond with a crushing display of military force. One of them says, I'll get a squad of cavalry, sir, and cut our way to Washington, sir. Lincoln doesn't want to do that at a time when he still hopes for reconciliation with the South. Pinkerton offers a better way. Pinkerton says, I will get you safely to Washington, but you have to put yourself entirely in my hands and in those of my most trusted operative. And this trusted operative, it turns out, is not a Pinkerton man at all, but a Pinkerton woman. And I love this part. One day, five years earlier, in 1856, Pinkerton is sitting at his desk, minding his own business. There's a knock at the door. He looks up to see a young woman standing there. She introduces herself as Kate Warren. She's a widow, 22 or 23 years old, and she's looking for work. Pinkerton assumes she's talking about secretarial work, and who could blame him? It's 1856. Susan B. Anthony is barely out of the starting gate. But Kate Warren looks at him and says, I have come to inquire as to whether you would not employ me as a detective. Pinkerton, as my wife, who is also Scottish, likes to say, is gobsmacked. <laughs> to his credit, he gives her a fair hearing. It is not the custom to employ women as detectives, he says. How exactly do you propose to be of service? And she's ready for this. She says, a female detective may go and worm out secrets in ways that are impossible for male detectives. A criminal may hide all traces of his guilt from his fellow men, but he will not hide it from his wife. And those women, she says, won't spill their secrets to a man, but they will tell another woman. And again and again, she would strike up a useful acquaintance, become friendly with the wife of a, of a suspected criminal, and slowly pull forth details that were useful to the Pinkertons. Again and again, that's what she did, and much more besides. And on the night in question, in the hour of peril, if you will, Lincoln was accompanied not by a squad of cavalry, sir, but by a resourceful young widow who posed as his sister and traveling companion. Lincoln, it seems, was charmed by this. And we're told that he had something pithy to say when he was introduced to Kate. He supposedly said, I believe it has not hitherto been one of the perquisites of the presidency to acquire in full bloom so charming and accomplished a female relation. <laughs> well, don't know if he actually said that, but I like to think so. Uh, well, as some of you will know, this is not the first book ever to feature Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Seen here the day after his safe arrival in Washington for his first inauguration. At the New Fords Theater Center here in Washington, as many of you will know, there's a winding five-story tower of books about Lincoln, 34 feet high. 
Not only have there been acres of very excellent books written by modern scholars, but you could build a bridge from here to Springfield out of volumes of reminiscence that were written at the time, Lincoln as I knew him books. And no two of them agree entirely on what happened in Baltimore. Sources conflict, historical agendas collide. Nobody can even agree on what Lincoln was wearing on his head on the night in question. So the fun part, as well as the challenge of doing this book, was to try to unpack some of that baggage, untangle some of the crossed lines, look past the highly charged politics of the moment, and try to get at the substance of what happened. You may ask, well, why should there be any controversy about it? Well, that part is easy. At the critical moment of the story, February 22nd, 1861, there were three men, three men at the center of it, and all three had reason to go fuzzy on the details. The first was Lincoln himself. This episode had been a public relations disaster for him. His advisors warned him that he would be ridiculed if he fell in with Pinkerton's plan, and he was. So Lincoln was anxious to downplay it and move on, especially because he needed Maryland in the Union. Public sentiment is everything, he later declared. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. The second player was Pinkerton, who insisted on total secrecy concerning his role, because that was quite simply how he did business. Secrecy is the lever of my success, he often said. And at the beginning of this particular operation, he wrote to the man who hired him and said, on no condition would I consider it safe for myself or my operatives were the fact of my operating known to any politician, no matter of what school or what position. It was unrealistic of him, once Lincoln became involved in the drama, to imagine that this could be kept quiet. Nevertheless, he did try. He did hope it could, and he extracted a, a promise from Lincoln himself that it would be kept quiet. He believed that loose talk on this subject would put his agents in danger. He believed the operation was ongoing, even after Lincoln had been safely delivered to Washington. Loose lips sink ships. And the third figure is a man named Ward Lamon, a friend of Lincoln's. Lamon came to hate Pinkerton with a boiling passion over the course of the drama in Baltimore. By the end, he was determined to see Pinkerton deprived of any credit. So, Lincoln you know, Pinkerton you've heard of, but who's this? Well, Lamon was this big 300 pound, hard drinking, glad handing, banjo playing lawyer from Lincoln's early days in Illinois. And when the time came for Lincoln to go to, to Washington, Lamon appointed himself as his de facto bodyguard. Under his coat, he carried two pistols, a large knife, a set of brass knuckles, and for good measure, a blackjack. Also something called a slung shot, which was a sort of uh, primitive, uh, looks like a, a, a slingshot, fired from the wrist. A truly amazing weapon. Lamon felt that he could handle pretty much anything that came his way. Pinkerton saw things differently, and the two of them just rubbed each other the wrong way. Later, when the feud between them had taken on real heat, Lamon accused Pinkerton of having fabricated the entire episode to burnish his own reputation. He wrote, 
being intensely ambitious to shine in the professional way and something of a politician besides, it struck him, meaning Pinkerton, that it would be a particularly fine thing to discover a dreadful plot to assassinate the president-elect. And he discovered it accordingly. He went on to say something else. It is perfectly manifest that there was no conspiracy. No conspiracy of 100, of 50, of 20, of three. No definite purpose in the heart of even one man to murder Mr. Lincoln in Baltimore. So, in Lamon's view, if that pesky, self-aggrandizing Alan Pinkerton had left well enough alone, everything would have been A-OK. -okay. And it's too bad that Lincoln, such a kindly and trusting soul, put his faith in such a man. So, three different men, three different stories. It's no wonder that there is confusion about what happened. So what's the truth? I will start by reading you two lines from a letter uh, that was written on February 23rd, 1861, at the very moment that this plot was unfolding. Just two lines. I was advised on Thursday morning of a plot in Baltimore to assassinate the president-elect on his expected arrival there. I sent Fred to apprise him of it. That letter was written by William H. Seward, Lincoln's designated Secretary of State, to his family on the day Lincoln arrived in Washington. Fred was his son, who carried a letter warning Lincoln in Philadelphia, where he had stopped for the night. Seward, Lincoln's indispensable man, the man who came within an inch of being the Republican nominee for president himself. This isn't Pinkerton spinning a yarn. This isn't loose talk in some Baltimore bar room. It's the Secretary of State. This is the equivalent of Hillary Clinton or John Kerry speaking to Barack Obama. This is the equivalent of John Foster Dulles talking to Ike or Kissinger talking to Nixon. This is like Dean Rusk telling John F. Kennedy there might be trouble in Dallas. Now, I'm sorry. I know that I sound like a fanatic on this subject. And if my wife were here, she would jump forward and hit me in the neck with a tranquilizer dart <laughs> and then slowly back away while I calm down. But it drives me nuts when people suggest that Pinkerton somehow sold that poor, gullible, Abe Lincoln, a bill of goods. Lincoln was no country bumpkin, and although he liked Pinkerton and trusted him, he wasn't prepared to act, wasn't prepared to take the, to take the dramatic steps that Pinkerton was asking of him on Pinkerton's say-so alone. He needed a second opinion, an independent verification, and he had one, more than one, as it turns out. And if William and Fred Seward were here today, they would be likely to remind us, spoiler alert, something bad happened to Lincoln four years later at Ford's Theater. And on that night, the older Seward got stabbed in the throat, and the younger one got his head cracked open by one of Booth's conspirators. So I imagine they would be even more fanatical on this subject than I am. Of course there was danger. Of course there was. The abolitionist president-elect of the United States was setting foot below the Mason-Dixon line in a slave-holding state for the first time. There is much to criticize about Pinkerton's operation in Baltimore. And the particulars of the threat are a legitimate subject for debate. But the existence of a threat is beyond dispute. As the newspaper editor Horace Greeley said, there was 40 times the reason for shooting him in 1861 than there was in 65, and at least 40 times as many 
intent on killing or having him killed. And Greeley finished by saying, no shot was then fired. However, for his hour had not yet come. As for Pinkerton, he came to regard this episode as the highlight of his career, even if, as he admitted to William Herndon, he had come upon it by lucky chance. From my reports, you will see how accidentally I discovered the plot, he wrote. I was looking for nothing of the kind and had certainly not the slightest idea of it. But on his tombstone, you can see what a modest <laughs> affair this tombstone is. One finds the following inscription. In the hour of the nation's peril, he conducted Abraham Lincoln safely through the ranks of treason to the scene of his first inauguration as president. So why this story at this moment? I mean, I'm guessing that most of you in the room will know that Lincoln survived to become president of the United States and that shortly thereafter, the nation was plunged into civil war. So why tell this story now? Well, there are two reasons. One, it's a barn burner of a story. <laughs> it reads like one of the yellow-backed adventure novels that Pinkerton himself loved to read in the day. You've got conspirators taking blood oaths at midnight. You've got detectives jumping off of trains. You've got the president-elect in disguise stealing through the seat of danger, as Pinkerton called it, under the sable wing of night. That's the first reason. And the second is this, and Dan puts his reading glasses back on and begins to read in a clear, pleasing baritone. <laughs> the events of 1861 continue to capture our attention, not only for the drama of the plot and its detection, but also because Lincoln's handling of the crisis and its fallout would mark a fateful early test of his presidency with many dark consequences. The stakes were enormous. Had Mr. Lincoln fallen at that time, wrote Pinkerton, it is frightful to think what the consequences might have been. And I hasten to point out, this is not an actual newspaper. It is uh, not a Dewey defeats Truman kind of thing. It is something that one of the mad geniuses at, uh, at uh, my publishing house whipped up, and I just love it so much that I can't resist. Uh, you see how it's got little age marks on it and uh, the tattered corners, and, and it's properly aged. I, I'm just crazy about it. Uh, to continue, there is no question that Pinkerton's methods were high-handed and at times unlawful but many of the criticisms that were heaped upon him in 1861 would not be expressed or even considered today. It is now understood that there are dangers to be apprehended when a president moves freely through a vast crowd or rides in an open conveyance. Those apprehensions did not yet exist at the start of the Lincoln presidency. As one New York, New York newspaper noted at the time, assassination is not congenial to the American character. Well, perhaps not, but it would soon become all too real. The events about to be related here have been for a long time shrouded in a veil of mystery, Pinkerton wrote in a memoir published near the end of his life. While many are aware that a plot existed at this time to assassinate the president-elect, upon his contemplated journey to the capital, but few have any knowledge of the mode by which the conspiracy was detected or the means employed to prevent the accomplishment of that murderous design. Strangely, those words are as true today as they were in Pinkerton's time, and the detective was already swimming against a tide of criticism when he wrote them. The distinguished historian John Thomas Scharf, chronicling the history of his native Maryland in 1879, insisted that Pinkerton's actions had been an insult to the fair fame of one of the chief cities of the country and expressed a hope that the matter would soon be resolved, settled rather, 
once and for all. I myself am a resident of Maryland, and I am as partial to blue crabs and black-eyed Susans as the next man. At a remove of 150 years, however, I believe it's possible to treat this episode without undue risk to the fair fame of Baltimore. It bears noting, however, that to this day, our state song, Maryland My Maryland, makes reference to the despot's heel and tyrant ch tyrant's chain of Lincoln and his kind, and builds to a final spirited rallying cry. Huzzah, she spurns the northern scum. <laughs> Lincoln would likely have been amused. <laughs> Fellow citizens, he wisely declared in the early years of his presidency, we cannot escape history. And I thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Sir. Was anybody ever prosecuted for any aspect of this conspiracy? It's one of the most peculiar uh, aspects of the drama, and it is yet another reason uh, why there is so much um, controversy, debate, and confusion over this episode, and I do detail it at some length. The short answer is a whole lot of people who were high-ranking officials in Baltimore were placed under arrest. But the men that Pinkerton fingered as being the conspirators actively involved in it were not. And in fact, the leader of them, after uh, disappearing from the scene for a while, actually returned and carried on as if nothing had happened. Uh, to my way of thinking, uh, this speaks more to Lincoln's need uh, to the, and the entire administration's need to get past it, not to focus on it, to keep Maryland in the Union, and to just carry on. The episode was very quickly swept aside by the fast um, march of events leading up to the Civil War, not least of which was Fort Sumter. When the war had ended, and the time had come when people might have gone back and taken a serious look at this, there was a, Lincoln had been assassinated, there were those conspirators to deal with, and I don't, I don't think they had a taste for stirring the ashes of the plot that had failed. Anybody else? Sir. I once heard several years ago that the commissioner of police in Baltimore uh, is now appointed, or since then, has been appointed by the governor rather than the mayor because of their involvement. Well, uh, yeah, it's... And, excuse me, could you repeat the question? Sorry. If I'm understanding you correctly, you've heard this is about the uh, police chief? Or commissioner. Or commissioner uh, of, of Baltimore. Now, now uh, or uh, since then, has been appointed by the governor of the state. Appointed by the governor. I honestly don't know that, but I, I can tell you that the gentleman who was directly involved uh, with this, a man uh, named uh, George Kane, Marshall Kane, um, what is an incredibly uh, interesting figure and an important part of this story. Pinkerton did not trust him, believed that he and the, uh, his police force would do nothing when Lincoln came through. He overheard him saying that, he that it w would only be necessary to, to, to detail a small police force. And many of the, the actions that Pinkerton took were based on, having, uh, on this assumption, that, that Kane was untrustworthy. Well, you come to find out, Kane seems to have had his own plan underway for seeing Lincoln pass through without excitement. He, he did have a plan, and if he had a plan, and of, cor of course it's difficult to know for sure, but it, if he had a plan, then his remarks that Pinkerton overheard take on a different, take on a very different construction. Well, there might not be that much need to detail a police force because Lincoln isn't going to be where we, we thought he was at the moment in question. Uh, 
I will also say that Cain, a man who showed great bravery uh, at, at many points during his career, uh, went on to become the mayor of Baltimore. Uh, so uh, as far as being appointed by the governor, that guy in particular, uh, although he spent time in prison, he was arrested, he spent time in prison um, in the immediate aftermath of the war, he went on to return to Baltimore and again hold, uh, hold office, which I, th I think s uh, speaks to, says something about the attitude of, of, of uh, moving past it. Sir. What was Mary Todd Lincoln doing at this time? Was she uh, here for her husband? A, a very, very good question. Uh, she's an important figure uh, throughout the story. Uh, there had been talk before the train ride started uh, that she was put off uh, by, going, by going along. She did not want to travel with her husband and she didn't want to have her sons along on the journey. She did travel uh, for most of the journey on the train uh, with Lincoln and there was uh, something said in the press to the effect of, you know, she, she'd been advised by her friends not to do it but she stoutly declared that she would stand by her man uh, come what may. You flip forward a few pages, Lincoln does what he does in Baltimore, which is to slip through, and there's some feeling abroad that, well, if there was so much danger, Mr. President, why did you leave your wife and family to pass through on the route you were supposed to take? You better believe the Baltimore Sun jumped on that. There were stories that, what gives? You know, it wasn't, we, wasn't good enough for you, but you left your wife and, and family to pass through. And there's a quote that I particularly love. So there is to be some pluck in the White House, even if it is under a bodice. <laughs> <laughs> but again, there, there, is, there are indications. And the, and the press accounts of the time directly conflict with each other. But there is one account that says she fell in with the plan of Marshall Cain, about whom you were asking, that she did get off the train ahead of, the, of when it pulled into the station, had lunch in the home of a prominent citizen of Baltimore, and then went to the station where she picked up the second leg of the journey and went on safely to Washington, which it, it was a very elegant way of sidestepping the problem. Anyone else? Uh, did you source the Pinkerton files and documents? Are there any source documents that Pinkerton is investigative? Files? Yes, there were field reports at the, at the time, which ironically survive uh, specifically because he lent them to William Herndon uh, for, for copying, and therefore they were not there when Pinkerton's, uh, when the bulk of Pinkerton's papers were destroyed in the Chicago fire. Mm -hmm. However, those papers then fell into the hands of Ward Lamon, the man who came to, to hate him so much, and he saw some rather indelicate things that Pinkerton had said about him in those documents, and that was uh, throwing gasoline on the embers and the feud between them he just went just the went sky. Up. No, 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 they still survive. Sir. How does this story relate to the Pratt Street riots? As this happened a couple of months later, I mean, doesn't that lend an awful lot of credibility? Uh, the, uh, what it the, yes, how does it relate to the Pratt Street riot, April 19, 1861? Uh, troops uh, from Massachusetts and elsewhere uh, reached Baltimore from the north. They had to follow uh, largely the same route that Lincoln would have taken, traveling from one tra train station to another to continue on to Washington. They were attacked. Uh, there were fatalities. It was a, a, a bloody episode uh, in, in which, again, Marshall Cain uh, played a significant role. And it was taken by many to be the clinching evidence that, yes, there was a problem. The, the idea was that something similar would have happened had Lincoln come. It's not as simple as that. You, 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 can't, it's not, you can't say because this happened, that would have happened. And indeed, the mayor of, of Baltimore at that time said, you know, if only Mr. Lincoln had appeared as scheduled in February, said a few soothing words to the crowd in that 
way that he has, perhaps this could have been turned aside. So once again, you know, there's, there, are, there are opinions on both sides of the equation. Ma'am. Can you elaborate on page 40 again? Uh, she's all over this thing. <laughs> but the idea, uh, and, and there, there's a one long chapter in here that's, that's one of her cases that I, that I particularly like. But uh, in this role, in order to get Lincoln safely from, uh, through Baltimore, they didn't want to have to charter a special train in the middle of the night, which would have called a great deal of attention to, to, it, to itself, particularly at that moment would have naturally drawn suspicion and likely have uh, suggested that there was a person of importance uh, traveling to, to Washington. So for one leg of the journey uh, from Philadelphia to Baltimore, Lincoln had to travel on a regular passenger train at night. And in order to travel on that regular passenger train, they were very concerned about making sure that nobody was going to pick him out easily. Well, this isn't easy. Uh, he's a very, very tall man with, who has just grown a very distinctive beard and is usually seen in a very distinctive stovepipe hat. So he didn't wear the hat. He had a coat that apparently he kept uh, bundled high around his face and Kate Warren was given the job of securing a sleeping berth, letting it be known that she was traveling with her invalid brother, who was very ill and not to be disturbed during the journey, and therefore uh, was able to keep people away and let him travel and deflect suspicion from this last minute arrival, this very tall, gangly figure arriving who needed to be hustled into the train moments before it left and uh, uh, was given an excuse, therefore, not to interact with uh, the other passengers and with the ticket collectors. And that, that was her doing. Uh, anyone else? Then I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. You're a good storyteller in print and in person. We all enjoyed your tale and uh, learning a little bit of history along the side. And we're very pleased that the Library of Congress, is, and especially the Pinkerton Diaries, which I didn't know about, uh, played such a major role. Uh, the next part of A Books and Beyond is always a book signing. Books are for sale out in the foyer, but we'll have Dan here at this table. And uh, I would like to form a book form the line this way if we could, and we'll get him started, but let's conclude with another round of applause for Dan Stashauer. Thank you. Good job. Thanks, Good job. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.